are so many Christians who name the name of Christ, who are washed in Jesus' blood and are partakers of new life. But deep inside they struggle with strong besetting sin. strong resolve it is not through anything that I can do I must learn to see myself upon the cross in Jesus Christ and in him I've resurrected to a pure I would just like to thank the Lord for saving my soul when I was 16 years old and um, raised in church all my life, but just so thankful that he 
saw fit to save me, just a rebellious little brat, preacher's kid that didn't deserve it. So thankful that he has allowed me to serve him. And like Brother Lindsay was preaching about the, the times where he just hides you when times in your life when he brings you through things to draw him close to you and so that he can use you. And I'm so thankful. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Jesus prayed in the garden before he went to Calvary. What lonely hours it must have been as his sweat became blood. Knowing what was up ahead and what was in the cup. My sins, though they were many, he faced them all alone. The shame and rejection meant for me, he paid it all. The sorrow that I should have faced fell away when they lifted him up. My sins. My shame, my sorrow, he drank from the cup. The crown of thorns placed on his head, I'll never understand. The stripes they put on his back to pay for my sin. If I could thank him every second, it would never be enough. For taking my Calvary and drinking my cup. My sins, though they were many, he faced them all alone. The shame and rejection meant for me, he paid it all. The sorrow that I should have faced fell away when they lifted him up. My sin, my shame, my sorrow, he drank from the cup. My sins, though they were many, he faced them all the shame and rejection meant for me, he paid it all. The sorrow that I should have faced fell away when they lifted him up. My sin, my shame, my sorrow, he drank from the cup. My sin, my shame, my sorrow, he drank from the cup. Some hippie dude working on me while you something very important like a heart. What does that got to do with that? Well, when it's quiet like it was with that music, that's the surgeon. The surgeon is doing what he's got to do. Just relaxing. Sometimes you got to say ouch. You know, sometimes you do. A lot of times people just don't want to do what they got to do. That's what camp meetings about. Where you out to where you're ready to do what you're supposed to do. Because if you leave and you don't have the joy of the Lord, I said joy, not happen. If you ain't got that peace inside of you, you ought to be, well, you just ought to know you need to get something right. You need that peace of God in you, man. And uh, so everybody's different. Everybody's got their little things. Uh, if you haven't hit the altar and you're not used to that, I suggest you try it one good time. Yeah. 
You're going to find out how many, how many, the atmosphere and the unseen world, how they all try to put pressure on you to stay seated. But it seems like once you get up and you start moving, it's like it's a release. It's like, wow, you get like a spring in your step before you even get here. I mean, you ought to be able to sacrifice a little bit like that, a little bit of embarrassment. Just think everybody in here is knowing you're the rottenest sinner that there is. After all, that's why you don't want to get up, right? Just say, I am. Bro, you said, just agree. Don't argue with the devil. Yep, mm, yep, mm. And just make it down and get some mercy. Amen. Evangelist Woody, would you come up here? Woody, and uh, preach to us. Amen. From Tennessee, Tennessee. Tennessee. Amen. Still, right? Tennessee, still. Tennessee, all right. Amen. Amen. Here's water here. I think we still got battery in here. Wait, maybe not. Let me see. Yep, green lights on. Green lights on. Well, praise the Lord. Good to be saved this morning. I sure appreciate the Lord taking that. Uh, I, got, I got to thinking when they were singing that song. You know, they came out with that song, Drinking from My Saucer. And because uh, the cup's overflowing, and I got to thinking, I'm, I'm able to drink from the saucer this morning because he drank from my cup. Yeah. Amen. That's the only reason I got any blessings, is just because of him. And uh, what a great God we serve. I sure do appreciate the Lord uh, meeting with us this morning. Amen. On a Thursday morning. World says, you know, you just keep that stuff Sunday morning only. I'm glad God says I can just meet with you any day I want to. Amen. Any time I want to. I sure appreciate the Lord. Amen. Take your Bible, go with me in the book of Mark. Uh, Mark. Uh, uh, let's see here. Mark chapter number ten. I had something on my heart here for a few days. I'm gonna try to give it to you. Hopefully, it'll be a help and a blessing to you. Challenge you maybe, Mark chapter number 10 and uh, verse number 35, we'll start reading here. And the Bible says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now, that right there, if you think about what they're saying, I know the Bible says come boldly before the throne of grace, but now that's bold. I mean, when you're standing there looking at the face of Jesus Christ, and uh, they say, we want you to do whatever we want. Amen. That's what he said. He said, they said, we, we, uh, uh, that we should, that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Is that not how most people look at God today? Most people look at God exactly the same way they, as a, as a uh, sugar daddy that just is supposed to hand out everything that they desire, and if it don't go their way, then the next thing you know, they say, well, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why didn't God do this for me? Why didn't God do that for me? How come God would let such a thing happen to me? Why did it happen to my family? What, why did it happen to my, my children? Why did it happen at my job, amen? Why didn't God do for me everything that I wanted? Right? They said, we desire that thou shalt do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And verse 36, and he said unto them, what would you that I should do for you? I mean, that's just the kind of God we serve, right? You want to be bold and make those statements, and yet God still blesses us. He said, what, should I, what would you that I should do for you? They said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit. One on the right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. 
but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. When they heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I bow before you here this morning, and I say thank you, Lord Jesus, for drinking that cup. Thank you, Lord, for all that you did for me at Calvary. And God, that's more than I deserve. I have no right to ask anything of you this morning, Lord. You've been better to me than I deserve. But yet at the same time, Father, I need your help. I pray, Lord God, you just help me preach what's on my heart. God, what you've spoken to me about, what you've shown me. And Lord, I pray to help these folks. And I pray God to challenge somebody that uh, might need the challenge this morning. God, may your will be done. May Jesus Christ be glorified. We'll thank you. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. God, I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to look at some things here that I was reading one day and reading through this just like normal. And God began to speak to my heart and show me some things here. And besides the, besides the boldness that we see out of James and John, keep this in mind. We're dealing with two individuals, James and John, who, who are two-thirds of the inner circle of God. Amen. You read through your Bible, through the Gospels, you have Jesus Christ, and then you have oftentimes Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James. They, they're, they're kind of what I call the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. When things would begin to get serious, amen, uh, when, when, when the Lord needed to do something a uh, little bit outside the, the, the uh, realm of uh, normal, uh, a lot of times he would send the multitudes away, but then when he'd get real serious, then he would separate even amongst his disciples, and he would take Peter, James, and John, amen? The inner circle, if you will. So we're dealing with two men here this morning that I believe with all my heart love the Lord. I believe they are have a walk with God that, that most others in this day and time don't have. I believe they have seen some things and heard some things and felt some things from the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that others have not got the chance to experience just because of their close proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ. I honestly don't know this morning what their motive is. Uh, I know if you, you uh, go over and read in the back of the book of Matthew, you find their mother put them up to this, kind of instigated this. I, I I really don't know exactly what their motive is for wanting to do this, but anyway, you have these two guys, James and John, who have, God has called them out of the world. They were just nobodies like me and you, and the Lord has called them out of that world, and He has put them in uh, His family, in His group, amen. Then He calls them out of His group, puts them in his inner circle, and they are living their lives like that, but for some reason or another, they decided that they wanted to get a little bit closer than they were. And that's not altogether wrong. I think tonight, this morning, I think we all ought to get a little closer to the Lord. Amen? I, I believe every one of us could stand to get a little closer. I, I, I mean, there, there's a... a there's, there's not a one of us, I would say, that's probably walking as close to the Lord as He would desire for us to be. Amen? And, and so there's nothing wrong with having a desire to get close to the Lord. We should want that. We need that. We've got to have that. Amen? That a long time, Brother Caleb was talking about, we've got to have that, that closeness, that oneness. I'm glad that, that uh, I, I don't have to go and introduce myself in prayer before I start to pray. I mean, it'd be a shame if you had to introduce yourself to God every time you need uh, need to talk to Him about something because you hadn't spent enough personal time with Him for Him to know who you are. Amen? Uh, it's like one preacher said, well, it's me again, Lord. <laughs> Didn't even have to know His name. It's just me again, Lord. Uh, one guy said this way. He said, when I pray and I have my close and long time with God, he said, I don't end it with an amen. He said, I just end it and say, well, okay, till next time, Lord. And next time he said, I get along with God, I pick right up where we left off. Because it's a relationship and it's a closeness and a oneness. And, and that's something that we've got to have, amen. And, and James and John had that. They had exactly what God wanted them to have. But here we find that they desired to get even closer to the Lord. Amen. And all entails, that's not all that bad, but yet 
when the Lord asked them, what will you do that I should do for you? They said unto him, grant us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Now, on the surface, and I read this so many times before God showed me uh, what I'm going to try to show you this morning. On the surface, I find nothing wrong with what they ask. It looks all fine and dandy and good. And Jesus, his response in verse 38 was, you don't, you don't know what you ask. You don't know what you ask. You, you have no idea what you're asking. How many of y'all have ever asked the Lord for something, and when you got it, you realized that that wasn't exactly what you meant? Right? I, I had one of those experiences here last week. Uh, I've been praying and asking God to help me lose some weight. <clears throat> he did. He sent me to the ER. I spent a few hours there, and I've been sick at my stomach ever since and can't hardly eat anything, amen? I said, all right, Mr. Woodby, the next time be a little more specific when you pray. <laughs> and God will give you what you ask for, and it may not be exactly what you was really thinking when you ask him, Amen. And the Lord is kind and gracious here, and he says to his disciples, he says to these two men, you two don't have any idea what you're asking. Now, I think literally what these two men had in their minds was that when this thing is all said and done, and we're there in our all eternal home, we would be able to have the Lord Jesus Christ sitting upon his throne, and I could literally be sitting on one side, and my brother could literally be sitting on the other side. I think that's what they had in their mind. But with their limited intelligence and their limited knowledge of what God had in store, they were asking for something that they didn't realize they were asking for. He says, you, you don't understand this. And, and you don't know what you're asking for. And then he goes on down to say in verse 40, he said, you, you know, you're going to have to drink of this cup and this baptism. But in verse 40 he said, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. Watch this. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Amen. I, I'm going to draft some volunteers out of the crowd to help me illustrate what Jesus is seeing and compare that to what these men are seeing. Now these men are seeing a literal throne with one of them on each side, right? I don't think I'm going too far off the deep end with that. That's not what Jesus is seeing. Let me show you what Jesus is seeing that these men are asking for, all right? Brother Bob, come here and help me just a minute. I'm going to let Brother Bob play the part of God. Stand right, in the, right dead in the center. I had no better object to pick than Brother Bob. This is God on his throne, right? Come on, Brother Drummond, help me. I'm going to let Brother Drummond stand right here and play the part of Jesus Christ. Right? Is this, is this, am I still in the Bible? This is what's going on, right? God, the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ. That's the Bible, right? Okay. Now, you have these two men that walk up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come here. And they ask this question. Come here. And they say, we want to sit. One on your right hand. Do we have a problem yet? No problem, right? And one on your left hand. Not between, right here. Do we have a problem? Definitely got a problem. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. They didn't realize that what he was asking was to take the place that belonged to God the Father. Because seated at the left hand side of Jesus Christ is God the Father. 
And when they asked to set one on thy right hand and the other on their left, the only way that Jesus can grant that is this right here. But there's one other option. We could... <laughs> shove them right in there. Do we have a problem? We either are going to cover up God and hide God and take God's place or we are going to ourselves drive ourselves as a wedge between God the Father and God the Son can I ask you who do you think this looks like that's trying to drive a wedge between God the Father and God the Son Jesus said you don't know what you're asking amen thank you man you don't know what you're asking is that not how we are sometimes? We are living our lives and we are serving God and we are praising the Lord and we are walking with God and we are in fellowship with Him and His Son and, and, and everything's going great. And then that, that pride somebody talked about rises up. And we start to overstep our bounds and get into a place and to a position that we have no business being in. Amen. We start to try to assume ourselves as the role of God in our own lives. And we want to try to play the position of God in our own lives. And we do it under the disguise of Christianity. We do it under the disguise of being right with God. Being full of the Holy Ghost. Being uh, super spiritual children of God. And we, if we're not careful, what we'll do is just like those men were trying to do, we will in, we'll stick ourselves right in the place of God, and the next thing you know, we are people who are trying to do a work of God without the power of God. And we're trying to do a work of God without the presence of God. Because we have tried to elevate our spiritual level to God's place. God still has a place, and it's still on the throne. And Jesus Christ said, let me tell you something, fellas. He said, that is not my place to give. That is going to be given to whom it is prepared. Amen. I mean, God is sitting there on that throne, and he has uh, uh, sent his son Jesus Christ down to this earth and performed his ministry, taking him back. And that is God's rightful place, and his right hand is the Lord's rightful place. And it is no man's place, but it's God's. Amen. We have no right, no business trying to interfere in God's place. But yet we do, don't we? How many times do we try to run our ministry and we don't ask God what He wants us to do? How many times do we try to run our homes and we don't ask God what He wants us to do? Amen. Try to run our career, we don't ask God what He wants us to do. We do our own thing. There's a guy in the Bible did that. His name was Saul. He wouldn't wait on Samuel to do his part. He wanted to elevate himself up and do, do God's part. Amen? He wanted to take over for God. Because after all, I mean, he has elevated to the position of being a king, and he's so great. Who needs Samuel, right? Samuel didn't show up on time. Who does he think he is? Let me give you one other little thought here. They said this, not only did I want you to see the position of what they're asking, but then the Bible says this in verse number 37, they said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Again, I think these two men had the eternal heavens in view. But listen, where is the greatest glory of Jesus Christ. Was it not at Calvary? Did he not receive his ultimate greatest glory when he died, was buried, and rose again the third day? Amen? Is that not what we look to the Lord as, and that is not his greatest attribute? That's what we worship him as our 
Redeemer as our sacrifice. Amen. We were doing that this morning through the song service and the preaching about how great Jesus Christ is and thank God that He died for us. Amen. That is where He got His glory. Amen. He is, uh, listen, that's where the love of God was manifested at. That's where God uh, uh, in, uh, uh, done His greatest work was at Calvary in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you don't have any idea what you're asking. We said, they said, we want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand in glory. And in their minds, they're thinking about the throne. But in Jesus' mind, he's thinking about the cross. Anybody want to trade places with those two thieves on the cross? I don't. I rejoice, Brother Caleb, in the fact that I didn't have to. Amen. I, I rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ took mine. He took the wrath of God. He took the death uh, that, that my sins were requiring. He took that, amen. I'm thankful for that. And Jesus said, you two don't have any idea what you're talking about because if you're going to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, that means Calvary. Now, we know spiritually, and that's what the Lord talked about. He said, yeah, you, you're, that, you're going to have to drink of it, and you're going to be baptized with that baptism. That's talking about our spiritual death. Uh, with him uh, through Calvary and salvation, amen. But he said, you don't know what you're thinking, what you're asking about. I'm going to tell you something, church. I think that uh, God spoke in my heart. I think there's times in our lives that we get too spiritual for our own good. I think we need to remember where we're at, who we are, and who he is, and where he is, and keep him in his rightful place. And that is on the throne room, amen throne room of our hearts, throne room of our lives, that we might serve Him in servitude, in humility, amen, in gratitude. Uh, these, these guys here, I think, I, I see a little bit of uh, ungratitude or as if the Lord owed them something more than what they had already got. We get that way sometimes. We get to thinking God owes us more than what we've already got. God don't owe you anything. He owes you absolutely nothing. He owes me absolutely nothing. Uh, the old song says, if he never blessed me again. Amen. God don't owe us anything. He's already given you far more than you deserve. If he never done anything else, if he never answered another prayer, if he never spoke another word to your heart, if he never squeezed your heart no, uh, not one more time, if you never felt his hand, his touch, his blessings ever again, God is still being good to you, amen. You still owe him a great debt of gratitude. But I'm afraid too many times we try to elevate ourselves, amen, into God's place and try to put ourselves up on a pedestal. And the Lord said, you don't know what you're asking for. Now, notice this. The Bible says here, verse 41, after this takes place, says that when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Now, wonder why those other ten got mad at James and John. i tell you what I think, because they didn't think of it first. Amen. That's what I think. I think they're mad at James and John because in reality, in their heart, amen, they really wanted to ask the Lord the same thing. They're just mad because these two come up with a plan before they could, amen. I believe they had the same pride in their heart that James and John had in their heart. I think they had the same, uh, uh, well, God, you owe me in their heart and attitude in their heart that James and John had in theirs. They got mad at James and John. Now, if you would have heard them tell it, their story would have probably went something like this. Well, we were upset with those men because uh, we knew they were out of place. We knew they were stepping above their bounds. And they had no business to do that to our Lord. But the reality probably is they were mad because they didn't, they were afraid that James and John were going to get the spot. That's what they were mad about. I mean, after all, if Brother Bob calls on them to preach, them to sing, time, I'm going to be left out, right? 
he asked them to do that in the church, and I don't get to do that in the church, I'm going to be left out. I don't get recognized. I don't get, that was their attitude. That's why they got all mad and been out of shape. That happens in our churches all the time. Why didn't they call me? Why didn't they ask me? Why didn't they shake my hand? Why didn't they talk to me? I could have taught that Sunday school class. Well, I could have run that bus route. Well, I could have did this or I could have done that. Why? And then they get mad. You know why? Because we're trying to get out of our place. We're servants. We're just servants. We're here to serve the Lord, here to please the Lord, and pleasing Him, amen, means being on the back burner, then you're on the back burner. If pleasing Him means you're on the spotlight, you're on the spotlight. No matter what God has for you, don't ever get yourself to the place like we saw these men here do where you either are faced with a choice of taking God's spot, hiding God, or driving a wedge between him and his son. And I can tell you this much, church. God loves you. God loves his children. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind about that. God loves you. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a... There's, there's a a connection between him and his son, Jesus Christ, we know nothing of. We get partaker of it because we're a son of God through the blood of Jesus. But them two right there have a connection, and we have no business getting in the way of that. Amen? There's a thing called chain of command that you have. That's the way it is. You have God, and you have his son, and then you have us. And we don't need to elevate ourselves up to that position. It costs it every time in the Bible you find somebody that elevated themselves above their position, above their calling, above what it is that God has for them to do. Every time you see them in the Bible do that, they, it costs them something. They lose it. Saul lost it. They lose their place. Every time you see a man that stays in his place, that stays in his spot, and does what God tells him to do, or humbles himself, he always gains. Amen? So be careful what position you want to try to put yourself into. Father, we love you. Thank you so much, God, for your word. And I hope and pray we helped somebody this morning or nothing else, Lord. Maybe we have been able in some individual's life, God, to help them see that you need to be first and foremost. Everything needs to revolve around you, not around us. Lord, have your way. Bless the rest of the meeting. Thank you, God, for the opportunity, Lord, to. Sent your word this morning. I pray you get the glory for it in Jesus' name.